The PJ Flex Show is brought to you by Cub Foods and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. It's the PJ Flex Show with Hobie RT, Rod Johnson, and Justin Gard. Let's row the boat. The axe is what matters. Does the axe come with something else, or does the axe just come with the axe? And but the axe is the axe, and that's what this week's all about. So, uh, doing everything we can to drown out the external noise because we can't control that. And I said, I don't want a bunch of sad people on Friday night if it doesn't work out, or or anxious people on Friday night if it does work out. That's not what we want. We want to eliminate that distraction. So our constant focus, right, is going to be on Wisconsin, where it should be. Well, it's the final regular season edition of the PJ Flex Show, and oh boy, it is a big one with Paul Bunyan's axe on the line on Saturday. Along with Gophers head coach PJ Fleck, welcome to the PJ Flex Show with Ron Johnson, KFA and Justin Guard. I'm Hobie Arteague, and coach, the final week of the regular season, you're still in the hunt for a trip to the Big Ten Championship game. And oh, by the way, you're playing your arch rival in the last game of the year. I know it's exciting for fans and all the build up for this, but there's a lot of work to go into it. However, do weeks like this get any more exciting for you? No, this is what it's all about. You know, you get to November and you're playing for something at the end, not only just your rivalry, but you're playing for something within the West possibly. So we said at the beginning, you know, we want to be able to play for championships in November. And we want to be able to do everything we can to, to perform our best and, and find ways to beat our rivals. And, and you have an opportunity to possibly do both this week. I mean, we a little bit of it is out of our control. Uh, we didn't earn that opportunity a, a few weeks ago, but – um, to say that we're battling for the Big Ten West Championship and, um, you know, and for Paul Bunyan's axe in the last game of the year, especially all this team's been through, um, I would say that that's, you know, um, successful so far. Yeah, Coach, when you look at Mo Ibrahim, I was able, I was blessed. A lot of people don't get a chance to get on the team plane, go to the hotel. I got to watch him, and I'm a big person about body language, uh, just facial expressions. I could tell that that was a kid that enjoyed being on those trips, that enjoyed being around his teammates. And then, then he announces he's back for 2022. What does that mean to the team to have, a, the, you know, basically the number one running back in the Big Ten coming back for next year? Well, I think it's just a credit to him. I mean, there's, you know, he had to make a very, very tough decision, and that decision's not easy. Uh, to make. Um, we all know that he's good enough to play in the NFL and will play in the NFL. I think it was very important to him to be able to finish up his career, uh, something very positive and nothing's ever gar guaranteed, but he had one half of football, but boy, it was a heck of a half, wasn't it? And <laughs> he's a very special person. Uh, he always puts his team first and I know that he loves the state of Minnesota, loves our fans and, and uh, loves his team. And he's worked incredibly hard. To, I mean, he's already walking and uh, but I think that he definitely deserves the opportunity to come back healthy and uh, really get what he's worth when, when you're talking about the NFL draft. But not only that, make this team a lot better. And, you know, he made this decision on his own. You know, I mean, obviously nobody's sitting there telling him what to do. He's got to be able to make that decision. But you do everything you can. You guide him. You give him facts. And you support him with different resources that he needs to make that decision. And I think our team's really excited that he's coming back. Off the top of the show, we heard that it's about the axe. The axe is the axe. I'm curious, now that you've been in this rivalry for a while and you've been on both sides, compare and contrast the feeling when you get the axe and you've got it for an entire year, and then when you lose it and you know that it's staying over in Madison for a while. What, what's that part of the rivalry been like after you snapped that streak and got the axe a couple of years ago? Well, when you have it, you don't feel like you're going to lose it right away, right? But we do everything we possibly can to enjoy it. Remember, we shared it with the entire state, and I think that's what it's supposed to be made for. I, I really do. I think that uh, the whole state should be able to enjoy that. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a border war and it's a, it's a border battle, and uh, those are the things that you know our fans, do, you know, the fans take very seriously. So, you know, it's really important to be able to have the axe. Everybody knows that. Uh, you know, when we won it, we hadn't won it for 14 straight years, something like that, and. You know, it's good to be able to get it back and that we lost it. Uh, and now we got to do everything we can to get it back. And I know they want to keep it. Well, to get that trophy, coach, it's all about the product on the field as well. And, and looking at that last game against Indiana, the passing game, it caught a lot of heat over the last couple of weeks, namely at the quarterback position. But Tanner Morgan, man, he really delivered against Indiana, winning his 25th career game. After a tough week, the game before, what was working so well for him where it just seemed like he really got in a groove as the game went on? Yeah, I think when you're talking about the heat, I think that's all external. Uh, that's not internal at all. You know, you're talking about a guy who's had four receivers rotate in throughout the entire year. Uh, most of our receivers have been out the entire year, uh, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, had five running backs out. 
So when you're talking about getting into a groove and, and having this big dynamic passing game, like maybe we had in 2019, but I don't know if the 2019 passing game is the same without Rashad Bateman and Tyler Johnson and Chris Hoffman Bell, right? So you got to have the players healthy to be able to do that. We're starting to get those guys back. And I think you saw what that could what was looking like um, maybe at the beginning of the year. Uh, but again, I think he's, he, he played really well. He played tough. He was courageous, uh, became the all time, you know, uh, leading uh, quarterback winner, uh, at the university of Minnesota in terms of wins. And I know it not, it might not be this big number, but that's where we're changing the program. Uh, I have 25 wins as the quarterback this is the most wins ever in the history of our program. And we got to keep raising that bar as we keep going forward. But, um, you know, he's done a great job of just keeping his oar in the water, just keep rowing the boat and leading this football team and drowning out all the external noise and, and just getting better every single day. Yeah, Coach, when you look at Chris Altman Bell, 11 career touchdowns, and this past weekend, two of, again, tough touchdown catches. Is there anything that he's going to do or hasn't done that surprised you? Um, it surprised me if he comes back for another year. Uh, <laughs> that would be something that surprised me. Uh, he, he's, 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 I've said this to you, Ron, before. Uh, you know, when you kind of talk about each receiver, he's not Rashad Bateman. He's not – Tyler Johnson, he's not Mohamed Sanu, he's not Vincent Jackson. He's his own person. Uh, but he's one of the most violent receivers I've ever coached um, in terms of just the way he attacks the football, uh, his ball skills, his body control, the ability to jump vertically incredibly quickly, control his body in the air, uh, know exactly where he is. He's got great spatial awareness. I mean, you're talking about a guy who can really play the game. Uh, and really, you know, unfortunately, he was hurt for most of the year, but really has embraced that number one role. And before he got hurt, I mean, he was playing some of his best football I've ever seen him play. So uh, I know his future is really bright as he continues to move forward. And hopefully, you know, if he might stick around if it works out. But if not, then we support him 100% to take that next jump. We've talked a lot over the years about your tight end production, specifically Co Keith on this show this year. We've talked a lot, PJ, about the potential of Brevin Span Ford and what he might mean for your offense. We saw that in full display in Bloomington, three catches. We've seen the hurdle already a couple of times tonight. So what has his progression been like in the program, and even this year, getting more and more responsibility and turning in a performance like that? Yeah, when we lost a lot of our receivers, our tight ends, they were going to be a big part of our passing game to begin with, but they needed to be, needed to be, right? We wanted them to be, and then they needed to be. Uh, when all the wideouts went down. So I think the wide, the tight ends have really grown tremendously. Uh, Co'Keefe and Brevin span forward. Uh, Nick Callerup, we call him Little Gronk. I mean, he, he's, <laughs> he's been involved. And then there's a kid by the name of Jamison Gears, who's a young player who hasn't even played yet that's very talented. So as we keep moving forward, our tight ends are going to be more and more involved. And, you know, since day one, I said I've wanted them to be. And uh, now I finally feel really good about where we are and where we're headed and the recruiting we've had. Uh, and the development with inside the program. But Brevin had a tremendous game. We're going to need those guys to keep having tremendous games and being a huge part of our offense, uh, not only this week, but in the bowl game and things like that, but into the years to come. Along some of those same lines, Coach, one of the guys who rotated in at wide receiver was Dalen Wright throughout this season. He had some great plays against the Hoosiers. What would you like about his performance in that game in Indiana? And also, what do you want to see from him, like you said, in the bowl game and moving forward? Because he's going to now be a key piece for this offense moving forward, too. Yeah, he was a big key piece at the beginning of the year, and then it just becomes consistency, you know, and tragically he lost his brother and was gone from our team for a few weeks, and uh, which I think everybody can understand and uh, wants him to be okay. But, you know, he only got one ball and caught it, but it was a huge third down catch. And, you know, he is a big, physical, fast wide receiver that's got a ton of room for improvement. He loves the game, just got to continue to mature and get better and grow. Uh, but he's a guy that can really play the game and, and, and really can have a bright future continues to be consistent, um, takes the coaching, and uh, really has a tremendous offseason as we get into next year. Yeah, Coach, you look at your running backs. I mean, they had a huge day against Indiana, Kai Thomas, Bucko Irving. But one thing I saw, too, when, when Bucky scored, you came off and had kind of a long conversation with him. I don't know if you can share it, but what, what are you telling him in that moment in the game? Well, they're, they're always learning, you know, and these are really young backs. These are both freshman tailbacks, and they're in such a key role. Uh, and so you're constantly coaching them. Uh, you know, no matter what it is, whether it's whether the, how to get their pads more parallel, quicker to the line of scrimmage. Uh, did they miss a hole? Did you do, you know, what'd you see? And, and it's really more just communicating and talking. What'd you see? Why? Because we see it, you know, a certain way. And then, you know, we never want to just, you know, you never want to put, you know, uh, limits on a back and say you have to do this because they're all so natural, but there are stages and progressions to how you run the football and how you run the zone schemes and so one of the biggest questions I always ask when they come over to the side is, what did you see? 
because it doesn't matter what I saw, right or wrong, uh, or what the proof is or the or the, or the, uh, the replay is. It's 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 what he saw, and why he did what he did. So we we constantly have those conversations, uh, you know, uh, off the field, and then we kind of work through those things together, and and go through the coaching and the teaching and the educating, and and uh, maybe he's feeling something that that we're not seeing. So it's constantly communicating that way. But that's what we were kind of talking about. Something we all saw in the second quarter, Coach, was the Gophers finishing drives offensively. I know coaches can't think this way, but I thought that those back-to-back -back touchdowns, you know, after the interception, to me, the game was over at that point. I know you can't think that way, but you were able to finish the drives there in the second quarter. What was the key to that? I mean, we've talked about finishing drives all season long. That was maybe your best performance in terms of finishing the drives for a quarter. Yeah, I mean, you can say that. I can't say that. I never <laughs> the game's over. With three minutes to go, I'm telling our team not to put the subs in yet because you never know. Uh, but when you're one and 11 as a head football coach before and you've been down 20 points and people come back and beat you uh, or you've been up by 20 points and they come back, and beat you, it, it, you're paranoid. You're constantly paranoid. Uh, so you've got to do everything you can to win the football game. We need to play a lot better and take every individual play as its own entity. Uh, and you always know somebody can come back. Uh, but that was really key for us. We score a, a critical touchdown with about 40 seconds left to go 14-7. Um, Indiana then tries to throw the football and, and, and go down the field and we pick it off. We got about 20 seconds to work, throw a quick out, get the ball out of bounds, run one more play, call timeout. Then we're able to throw the ball with about, you know, 14 seconds left on the clock to a touchdown to Chris Hoffman Bell and then make it a two score game. And, you know, we weren't getting the ball in the second half right away. So we, I felt really good about those, those touchdowns um, or getting points. I mean, we were going to get either a field goal or a touchdown. I mean, if Chris doesn't catch that, we're going to run the ball and then kick a field goal. So um, we were either going to be up 21 seven or 17 seven. And that was hopefully the plan if we made the field goal. Coach, looking at your defense against the Hoosiers, Indiana, I believe, had 85 rushing yards to start off the game on that opening drive. A nice long drive that ended in uh, points. But after that, you guys really shut down everything that the Hoosiers threw your way. What changes were made that kind of allowed the defense to really settle down and shut down Indiana's offense from there on out? Yeah, usually, you know, you have an opening script, um, and most teams do, of about 12 to 15 plays. It's kind of go in order because you kind of know what you're going to get. Uh, and it's also some things that maybe you have some wrinkles here and there. Uh, and you're going to see what people are doing formationally and see how they're going to play you. Um, you know, Indiana came out and we didn't know which quarterback was going to play. They have four quarterbacks and two of the quarterbacks are very similar. Two of the quarterbacks are very similar on, on an opposite end of the spectrum in a different way. And so we made two different game plans. And when they came out number zero, we had the number zero game plan. But then when they came out number zero, they did so many things that we had never seen on film. Uh, not only that, they had some wrinkles to some new things. So it was more about just getting through the first drive uh, and then making those adjustments from there. And then, you know, you kind of know how they're going to play you from there and what the game plan is and what they tend to do uh, and how they're going to attack you. And I think we did a really good job on the sideline, uh, our coaches did, of, 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 of adapting and, and making some, some, some critical changes to the game plan, critical changes to the adjustments they made, and then uh, we're able to settle down. Ron, by the way, did you call Marquise Irving Bucky earlier? No, Bucko. Okay. No, he said Just Bucko, checking. On this Run week, man, you can't do tape. that this week. He doesn't week. make that mistake. I don't can't that do that mistake, this week no. of all weeks. Well, speaking of, we're moving on to the biggest game of the season for the Gophers up to this point as they bring home, or at least a tip to bring home, Paul Bunyan's axe as they try to get a win against Wisconsin. We take a look at the Badgers, a team that's bouncing back after a slow start to the season. Much more when we return here on the P.J. Flex Show. Let's row the boat. You're watching the P.J. Flex Show. Welcome back to the P.J. Flex Show, along with Gophers head coach P.J. Fleck, Ron Johnson, and Justin Gard. I'm Hobie Arteague, and Coach Wisconsin started off the season kind of on a roller coaster, 1-3 to open up the year against some top 25 teams, a lot of talent that they were facing, but they've really seemed to kind of find their identity as of late, seven straight wins. What's changed for them from what you've seen over the course of this season? Well, I think when you look at the beginning of their, 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 their season, their schedule was brutal. You can talk about top 25 teams right out of the gate. Every game was really close. Every game came down to one possession. So could have went either way. I mean, this, this truly could be an 11-0 Wisconsin football team ranked in the college football playoff as number, you know, one through four. They're that good. They're that good on defense. Uh, they've got a running back that's about 6'2", 242 pounds, that you know, can really fly and run, too. Uh, he's only 17 years old. And they started playing him somewhere around the Michigan game. 
uh, had some backs injured, but they, they just they just continue to reload. I mean, it's a Wisconsin team that's probably one of the most balanced teams that, that I've seen since I've been here, offense, defense, and special teams, and there he is uh, right on cue. And uh, that's what he does. He's hard to bring down. He's hard to tackle. Then you throw in their really massive offensive line who's really good, throw in their tight end who's really talented, who's all-American material, quarterback who's incredibly accurate, wide outs down the field that can play, and, oh, yeah, top two defense in the country. Yeah, Coach, you talked about in there, Braylon Allen. What, how do you plan to stop a guy like that that's averaging 7.9 yards per carry, which leads the NCAA, um, and, and just his size, and you said it, what, what, he's a tough runner. What makes him tough, but then, or it's tough to stop, but then how do you counter that? I mean, he's 240 pounds running at you really fast. <laughs> he's got elusive feet. Uh, he can move sideways uh, shockingly uh, effortlessly. I mean, it, it's unbelievable to see somebody that big move that fast and that fluid. It just doesn't look common. You know, it doesn't look it doesn't look natural uh, or normal, I should say. It looks natural. Yeah. Like it just it, you wouldn't think he's that big. Uh, his offensive line does a great job opening holes for him. But if they're not open, he finds a great way of creating the hole. Not only that, he presses his blocks so well. I mean, he, he, he can run right to the heels of an offensive lineman, make a sidestep cut and then get vertical so quickly. I mean, it's you would think that he makes moves and runs like he's 5'9 or 5'10 and maybe 200 pounds. Uh, but to do that at that size, uh, that is that's special, everybody, special. So we got to work it out for us. We got a game plan, and we got to do everything we can to ga- uh, execute that game plan on Saturday. Early in the season, the Badgers were giving up sacks. They were also turning the ball over, specifically in the passing game. That's changed here the last seven or eight weeks as well. So how have you seen, as you've gone back, and I assume watched a lot of that, their passing game kind of develop as the season's gone on? Well, I think their pass game has developed a little bit more because the running game is, is a lot more consistent. Uh, you look at the beginning of the year, running backs were getting hurt left and right, uh, and it was just a little inconsistent. Then they threw the ball a little bit more and maybe were inconsistent early throwing the ball because uh, they got away from a little bit more of what they really do in the run game. Um, and next thing you know, um, here comes number zero, and they get right back to running the football, get right back into the play action pass game, get right back into completion percentages, and and they're actually better now than they were probably to start the beginning of the year. And they're a really good football team, well coached, uh, very disciplined. And again, we have to be at our best on Saturday. You touched on their defense a little bit, Coach. You mentioned their run defense and also their scoring defense, both top in the NCAA right now. But last week, Nebraska found a way to score 28 points. That's something that the Badgers had not allowed in many of their games before that on this winning streak that they have right now. How closely is your team watching that game in particular to kind of look for some open opportunities that the Huskers were able to execute on? Well, I think you got to look at the game to know how they scored the 28 points, right? Uh, you got to look at how they did that. Um, there's a lot of times there was, uh, you know, it was the second play. Uh, it was extension of the play. It was a scramble that, that went to an explosive play. Uh, I thought Nebraska ran the ball uh, pretty well, uh, but it was, uh, it, it was some other things like the second play, scrambling, getting the ball down the field, um, which, again, you've got to be really good at too. Uh, Wisconsin forces you uh, to be able to, you know, be incredibly efficient. But they gave up some plays down the field that were some cross-country routes and some, some deep play actions. And um, But, again, that was probably a team that right uh, did the best job uh, against them all year in that category. All right. Well, still much more to come here on the P.J. Flex Show. Thanksgiving weekend usually means the axe, but it's much bigger than what goes on on the field as well for the Gophers. The Gophers getting out to do a yearly tradition of service with their row the boat turkey drive. We'll chat about that and much more when we return here on the P.J. Flex Show. Welcome back to the P.J. Flex Show. Let's row the boat. Coach, it's no secret that you have a unique approach to coaching in college football. And one thing that's very different is you have bedtime story time with players before the game. Guess where did you come up with that idea? And, and you've said it before, there's always a message in kids' books. So how do you go about picking different ones throughout the season to make sure the message is getting through? Well, first of all, just so everybody knows what we do, it's just I, I always do the bed check. But prior to the bed check, uh, we have a team meeting. And you know, I always read a children's book uh, that has to do with kind of the, the lesson of the week or the theme of the week, because you can find any children's book, right, to reflect back on any type of theme that you have. There's a children's book for every life lesson. So it's something we've always done. I've done it for nine years. 
it kind of gives a little bit of a light mood to kind of tense situations and and uh, really just kind of brings the whole you know theme of the week you know into focus through a very simplistic book uh and that's it and then go check them into bed and, and then they go but it's not like i go to every room and read a book it's, uh, <laughs> we have, we have a, it's a tea it's a tea meeting it's a and thing. usually i adapt the children's book a little bit here and there i i uh change the narrative a little bit here and there to make it fit our team uh i've been known to do that uh so yeah uh, maybe write on the book change the title of the book make some notes inside the book and we write some of them so uh, to make it all fit. But uh, I think it's something the players always look forward to. And they always try to guess the book and, and guess what's <laughs> going to happen. And, but again, you, you gotta, you gotta have fun while you're doing this and smile. And, and uh, there's always times to teach life lessons for sure. Yeah. Co I, I propped my door open. So I was waiting for you to come check on my bed, but you didn't <laughs> check. So uh, the roll the boat turkey. You weren't in there. I checked. <laughs> yeah. There's no bed check. No curfew. The, the roll the boat turkey drive was back on this year and you were giving away turkeys to those in need. I mean, why do you continue to do this? And what, what do you think this means to the team and to the players, uh, you know, with this experience, especially this year? Yeah. I mean, uh, winning, losing aside, I mean, results aside, this is this program serving and giving um, it was about creating winners and um, you know gave away around 300 turkeys and Thanksgiving Day meals yesterday and um, you know we have a lot of players who, who live a life of uh, philanthropy already and if they aren't or they haven't uh, we want to be able to open those opportunities up for them to just spread positivity I mean think about that to spread positivity put a smile on people's faces uh, change lives make sure everybody can have a, a, a safe and positive and, and fun and memorable Thanksgiving that's what this thing's all about. You know, we live in a pretty negative world outside when you step outside. Um, and we're in a pretty rough time in, in our country. And, uh, but if we can spread some hope, some cheer, some positivity, then uh, everything's worth it. Uh, Norris Wilson, uh, who's a former gopher and, and on our staff of player development, does a great job, uh, you know, running that for us. And just really proud of our players for their efforts last night. All right, Coach, happy Thanksgiving and best of luck against the Badgers.